Well, first and foremost, I want to thank Dr. Lee for inviting me to be your guest lecturer. I take great honor at being here with you today and sharing the exciting aspects of research in history. The title of my talk is Ah Comana, Disrupting the His Story of 16th Century Mexico. Uh, ah Comana, it's from the Nahuatl language and it means to disrupt or a disruption. So if you ever read my thesis, you'll see how that term is really important throughout each chapter. And the thesis, you can find it on ProQuest, or if you email me directly, I will happily send it to you. Okay, so where we begin my, my history with Dr. Lee, I'm looking at the graduate program. I'm not sure what I want to do. I've been studying indigenous history for a while, but I have not focused on indigenous women. So at first, I've always been interested in indigenous women's history, but I have never solely focused on it and prioritized it as my foundation of research. So why am I interested in indigenous women history? Well, growing up, you know, if some of you probably seen these images before, uh, I am from LA, grew up in the 80s and 90s, and what I was exposed to of what an indigenous woman was, was not the most positive image of an indigenous woman. Um, we have uh, comedy shows where they depict indigenous women in a very, you know, racist way. Comedy shows, cartoons, and Pocahontas. So there's very general ideas that we get about indigenous women. And as historians, I believe that our biggest impact and our biggest responsibility is to go from the very beginning to the archive. What are scholars presenting and how is that knowledge you know, trickling down to the education system, trickling down to the national narrative of indigenous women. Um, so basically my question was, how do we centralize indigenous women and dismantle ignorant perspectives? And like I said, the conversation with Dr. Lee, I said, okay, well, I have an idea. I want to focus on indigenous women. I want to focus on agency. Um, I studied somewhat indigenous, you know, peoples of New Spain under the Inquisition, the Spanish and indigenous relationship. Um, and I remember telling her, you know, there's no, there's no history of women. There's no images of women. There's hardly any, you know, the presence of indigenous women. It's not really there. And then she kind of looked at me, you know, in a very sweet way. And she's like, um, well, you know, you should do your research on that. And I'm never going to forget that because I was totally wrong. And again, what, is, what do I want to do? Once I'm going to take you with me on my journey of research, I'm not going to talk about all the primary sources. I just want to focus on two, which I think will kind of highlight what the process was and how I brought in interdisciplinary approaches to that. And basically what I want to approach in my argument in approaching the archive is that yes, there's been a lot of efforts. Yes, there's been a lot of movements to challenge the narrative. You guys read Kamala Townsend recently. Um, she definitely impacted me in the way that I viewed indigenous history and kind of allowed me to imagine and give myself the opportunity to take that liberty in a responsible way to imagine what the intentions were of indigenous women. So basically in looking at all this, I argue that the majority of the perspectives when we're looking at indigenous narrative is still predominantly focusing on male agency. So yes, what was my archive? Um, I didn't put it on here, but I was looking at everything in Dr. Lee's uh, courses, which I took many. She encourages you to look outside of just the historical archive. I was looking at sociology. I was looking at anthropology. I was looking at um, cultural anthropology, archaeology. There's so much, you know, so much resources that we can use as historians as we're putting together our argument or our puzzle. And basically, my biggest, you know, contest to all this, my biggest argument, and something that bothered me throughout the whole process is, you know, how do we recover the experiences of indigenous women 
in the system of patriarchy, which continues to dominate the majority of this whole institution of history. And I think that's something that a lot of uh, current historians are exposing and kind of you know dismantling, but also responsibly and respectfully saying, you know, there's a lot of things that we really need to challenge in the way that we tell a people's history. And those are some of the lists, I'm sure some of you have already been exposed to them, I won't go through them, but that's where I kind of started. <laughs> that's not all of them. Okay, so as during this process of researching, this is, I never went to this library, but <laughs> I was at the Cal State LA Library a lot. Um, again, this was for my thesis work, so it might be a little bit different from you, but this was also my work when I was doing my capstone. This was also my, my place where I was doing smaller research. And you get to a point where you're like, okay, where do I look? What am I looking for? What am I finding? When do I stop? How is this making sense to me? And it could be a very dark tunnel. That happened to me a lot. I had to tell Dr. Lee, I, I'm finding a bunch of stuff. I, I'm drowning in primary sources. I don't know if it's working. It, it, I was just looking for indigenous women in the archive, and I was drowning. So much like my assumption is that there are a lot of images, a lot of instances, a lot of references of indigenous women in the archive. And that was the biggest mind-blowing aspect to me because I hadn't come across that. And I try to study this on my own, but it was there. It's been open. It's before our eyes. But the challenge is, what do we make of those moments? And I'm going to get into two examples today. I'm going to focus on the textual primary source, and I'm going to focus on a visual primary source. Um, the very first textual primary source that we're going to get to comes from Book 12 of the Florentine Codex. And towards the end of the fourth day of the battle with the Spanish around 1520, uh, a Mexica woman, quote, came to very close quarters with our enemies, throwing water at them, throwing water in their faces, making it stream down their faces. I remember reading that, and this is a really small point, right, of uh, book 12. And it, it stood with me. I documented it, I wrote it in, and I said, there's something to this. That lady's not mentioned again. We don't know the name. We don't know the fuller context of what this encounter was like. But getting my engines rolling as far as cultural anthropology, knowing what I know about the Mexica worldview, knowing what I know about the theology and different world interpretations, I started digging deeper behind what does water mean to the Mexica? What, is, what does that potentially reveal about this encounter? And this is my interpretation. So at first you read that and you're like, okay, well, doesn't give me much, doesn't give me a name. But I was like, no, we have to put ourselves in that woman's life, in that moment. What was her world like? What was her worldview like? What were the possible influences that she had in her cosmology, in her frame of reference? And then I started to study and look at what does water mean in the Mexica culture and many other Mesoamerican cultures. So you see water and war, it's a big aspect of a lot of the ceremonies. In the water ceremony when the child is born, um, in fertility, in agriculture, and also in war. And very, you know, very closely, I started reading more into actual what they call goddesses. I don't like that term. I rather use sacred manifestations. Um, so what I came across is Chalchitlique. And Chalchitlique is what they describe the sacred manifestation of the female notion of water. And she's described as Fear, she's causing terror, she drowned one, she plunged one into the water, submerged one, caused the water to swirl over one. So even though we have a very positive aspect of water, we have childbirth, where there was a bathing ceremony, agriculture, that's a big aspect of that, we also have a very violent and a very um, repressive aspect of water, which we see the dual force 
of nature represented. And so thinking of that and thinking of the different aspects of Mexica cosmology and thinking back to that moment where we have that woman splashing water into the face, I'm thinking there's more to that. Perhaps it is my argument that she was invoking Chalchitlique. She was invoking the power behind water in a destructive way in a form of self-defense. And that is something that I back up again with anthropology, with theology, and it's something that I hadn't come across. So making these type of arguments, it can be a little you know, intimidating because I, I studied, I kept looking, I kept trying to find this woman in other scholarship, and I couldn't. And so part of me was intimidated by saying, can I make this argument? Is it probable, is it realistic, is it gonna be acceptable? Then I read other scholars and other scholars and I said, well, that's my argument. And if I find that it's wrong, and if I find that someone else made it, I'll just, you know, it's okay. I will accept it, I will congratulate, and keep moving on. So it was hard for me to put this together, because you hear all this insecurities, like, oh, what do you know about this? People have been studying this for decades now. But you have to have that confidence in your research, and you have to be able to connect the dots in a way that are subjective, um, I'm sorry, the way that is subjective, and the way that can clearly stand on its own ground without you having to interpret. You put this before people, and the dots all combine together. So that was my unique uh, contribution in my thesis. <coughs> now for my favorite image that I came across. This is the example that I'm gonna use for the visual primary source. I came across this and I was completely shocked that I had never seen this before. Um, some of the scholars that I've come across have mentioned it, but they don't really plunge deep into it. And I was really, really intrigued by this image, right? We have images of women in the rooftop, uh, bare-breasted, right? Hair down. It looks like they have the warrior weapons. We have a woman down here who seems to be squirting milk from her breast, and she is not hiding, she's kind of running towards the enemy in a battle scene. So to me, that was very intriguing. And again, I'm looking at that, and I did find other scholars who didn't say, the reason they did this was because of this, or it was part of their culture. Um, some people saw it as they were just desperate, it was just a desperate move. Um, other people have kind of hinted at it, but they haven't really explored the possible meanings behind those actions. And again, being in the, in the place where I want to put us in that position, put us in that world view of what those women were exposed to, and to really bring meaning to those actions, because much like the trope of women in history, Oh, they're just neurotic, they're just irrational, they're just thinking emotionally. So a lot of that is still in the interpretations that we get. And in my thesis, I get into how renowned scholars continue to perpetuate those ideas of indigenous women. And so when I looked into it, and this, I was able to add later. So this you won't find in my thesis. But that's what you'll find out. You're learning, and then you're going back, and you're re-researching. So if I ever consider going into a PhD, I'm definitely gonna bring this into that new journey of my scholarship. So what we're looking at is Siwateteo. A Siwateteo, it's a sacred woman believed to be a spirit of a woman who died in childbirth. This idea of childbirth, this idea of sacredness, this idea that when a woman is in childbirth, she's on the battlefield of life and death. And many historians have talked about this. Um, Inga Clinton, um, Townsend, uh, Klein, Cecile Klein. There's a lot of people that have already touched about that and have actually explored what that meant. And then in the research, you find out that there's another sacred manifestation. Her name is La Solteo. La Solteo is a sacred manifestation associated with birth, fertility, midwives, purification, and also filth. She's seen as the cleanser of filth 
and disease, right? So looking at these ideas, understanding the frame of reference, the world view of indigenous people, and then you zoom into that moment where those women are in that battlefield, and I, I'm interpreting this as it's not a neurotic, emotional, irrational, desperate move, but in my argument, I'm taking it further because if women or, or pregnant women and the whole realm of childbirth is considered sacred, well, these women, as we can see, if they're grabbing their breasts, they're actually squirting milk from the breast, they must be recent mothers, right? So they still have that realm of sacredness, that realm of power. And what I'm looking at is that they were actually using the breast milk to symbolically fight off the bacteria of the enemies. And then looking back at La Solteo, thinking back of Siwateteo, we're looking at all of these aspects of women in the sacred realm, but what I'm finding and what I'm arguing is that that was a daily cultural reference for women. And they used it in these type of specific moments of battle and war. So with those two examples, I'm kind of showing you how you come across a primary source. You know, if, if you come across something that's important, don't put it away, don't discard it, keep it there. It may make sense later in your research. So don't discard anything that is intriguing to you or that is kind of in your mind, that's kind of you know lingering there. Um, and as you can see, I know this course is really inviting and challenging the methodology and the limitations of history. We're looking at, like I said, anthropology, archaeology. Um, I also get into linguistics in my paper, and I also get into some of the, so even like popular culture as primary sources. As you saw at the beginning of my of my talk today, I also get into that, right? Because everything is connected. Everything influences and impacts the other. I'm not going to get too much into the people that I reference, the scholars that I reference, you probably are um, familiar with them, especially Kamala Townsend. I read her book, the article, Burying the White Gods, in 2008, when I was at East LA College, and it blew my mind. And I couldn't believe that when I was an undergrad student, I actually emailed her, um, asking her some questions, right, about her work, and she actually responded. So. You know, don't be afraid to reach out to these scholars, to these historians. They're, you never know how willing they are of helping you and including you in their, you know, their discussions and their recent research. Some of the other sources that I looked at, this is the other um, textual primary sources and some of the other visual primary sources. So you can kind of see there are a lot, but again, this is a five chapter thesis, so you kind of have time and place to do that. Um, in a smaller research paper, I would just recommend try to boil it down, maybe three and three, two and two, however, however long the paper is going to be for your, for your courses. But what, the most important thing, instead of just giving a list of a bunch of stuff, is try to find a primary source, whether it's text or a visual, that really represents what you're trying to argue and really delve into it. Because as you guys know in primary source analysis, that's what you're doing. You're getting a primary source and you're looking at it from different perspectives. Try to look at it through the anthropology perspective, linguistics perspective. There's so many dimensions to this new primary source that you're looking at that you found. A testimony. Um, it can even be an architecture. There's a lot of things you can do with that. So that's my, my tip. And as far as, you know, being in academia, it could seem very isolating, um, especially when you're doing research for a particular topic. It's due, it's 15 pages, it's 20 pages. I really recommend that you look at lateral research, that you reach out to your peers, that you reach out to other historians here at Cal State LA, and you're gonna see that they have so much more to contribute and possibly um, add to your research. For example, uh, when I went to the research symposiums of 2018, I forget, 
forgot already, 2019. I did research um, and I presented my paper at that time. It was very, very brief. But Dr. Lee encouraged me to reach out to another scholar from Cal State LA. Her name is Raquel Rojas, and she's an art historian. And so I went to her talk, to her presentation, and I was completely, my mind was just like lit. Her information, her interpretation of history, especially looking at the uterus in um, Mesoamerica, was very empowering, was very inspiring, because I was able to meet someone else who was actually drawing very similar conclusions to the work and whom I've never met before. So your research on its own is gonna connect you to other people. So I would say be open to that. Don't be intimidated, reach out. Like I said, Townsend responded, so that's cool. Um, you never know, right? You never know how people are gonna, they're ready to help you. They just, they wanna be reached out to. And, and use it. As far as theory and methodology and all that, it's important for you to kind of have a foundation. It's not, when you're looking at a primary source, it may not come to you at that time. Sometimes a primary source won't make sense. It won't connect with your theory. Sometimes a primary source is going to change your argument. Sometimes a primary source is going to give you new information. So I think the most important thing is as you're putting your paper together, be open, don't be so committed to the initial argument that you're making because sometimes it will not work, it's going to change, and you have to be open. Be open to what's going to come to you. And a lot of the times, I didn't have, have much experience with this, but sometimes the research itself makes its own argument, and you're simply there to put it together and voice it. And I think that's the power of being historians, where we come in with all these assumptions and all these biases, and this is the way it is, this is what I've watched and been influenced with. But as you're doing the research and you're unmasking and you're, you know, kind of peeling away these layers, there's a whole new other interpretation or argument for you. Unanswered questions. There's a lot at this point. My thesis is published, it's done, it's accepted. But there's still a lot of things that I wasn't happy with. Like, I wish I, I could have written a longer one. I wish I could. And then sometimes as I'm doing the research, and I did this too. I'm coming across research, and I'm like, man, I can't add this, because if I add this, I need to write a whole new chapter about this whole new primary source. And so, like I said, you, it's important, but put it aside. You know, you have to kind of be realistic with what your objective is, and be committed to that. There's gonna be time. There's gonna be time for you to come revisit, maybe your next class, maybe your thesis, if you're thinking about doing that. There's gonna be moments where you can go back and revisit. My questions that I have, I wanted to do this quantitative data of images of women. I wanted it, at the beginning, I was like, I'm gonna do a graph of all the times that women are mentioned in the archive, from the Florentine, to the letters of Cortez, to Chimalpaín, and then I'm gonna make a graph about all the time that women are, are seen or drawn into the archive, and then I, I just couldn't, right? But I still wanna work on that, I wanna see what that means, is there a disconnect between the visual interpretation or the textual? You know, I wanna know what that balance looks like. I wanna know, is that gonna tell me anything? Um, also, comparative examples. I'm interested in knowing about other indigenous women. You know, my thesis was about Navajo women in particular, Tlatelolca, Mexica, uh, of the central Mexico, but I'm really curious about Mixteca women. I'm even curious about even going up north, right? Some of the Native American women. And finding, is there a commonality? Are there similarities? Are there differences? How, how was that impacted? So looking at this history really challenged me and is very intriguing to see what are the other histories like? What are other primary sources like? And to compare that. And challenges, like I said, the limitations are, you're gonna come across them. You just have to be committed to what you're researching, and you can, if you're interdisciplinary, like, at first I was very overwhelmed, because I was including uh, linguistics. I'm not a linguist, right? I was including anthropology. I'm not an anthropology major. But when you are doing an interdisciplinary approach, it could be, it could be, potentially, 
a bad place if you're just grabbing and grabbing and grabbing and it has to do with my topic so I'm gonna put it in there and then you're having to justify why you're putting it in there it doesn't make sense it is bad you guys it's a dark tunnel it's a dark tunnel so I would say try to narrow it down say I'm using this because of this I'm using anthropology here I'm using linguistics here and that's it and close it because if you keep going it's beautiful, it's exciting, it's interesting. But at the same time, it could really blur you away and it could really you know, make you lose focus on what your ultimate argument is. And special collections. You guys already been there? Everyone with special collections? Okay. I love that place. I did not know that place. Okay, this is very new to me. Okay. So when I got here at Casa de Ley, I thought, I knew that Casa de Ley had the biggest collection of, of primary sources, of foreign codex. I thought the fact that the library had that collection made it special. That was my thinking. I'm working full time, I'm going to school full time, I'm never that special because they have it all there. I can go and borrow the foreign codex. I can go and borrow Chimapain's letter. I thought that was, enough I thought that was extraordinary I thought that was awesome and my last semester of graduate school Dr. Lee's like did you go to special collections already and I'm like yeah she's like and I'm like wait special collections that's a different part of the library she's like yeah I was like oh my gosh so there I go into a special collections and I was blown away you know how you can you have water there it's very particular it's the whole culture of being a historian and it blew my mind so I'm there it's my last semester of graduate school and that having that access and having that privacy and having that intimacy with primary sources really does shift your understanding of primary sources and makes you feel like I say more in tune with what a historian is and it makes you understand the seriousness of what we're doing so I'm very lucky and fortunate that I was able to go. Um, it's something definitely that I encourage freshmen to go there. Uh, freshman students, sophomore, get to know special collections. They have so many resources, presentations, and digital libraries. Sometimes you don't have to go to Mexico City to the libraries there because they probably won't let you go in. Um, but there's digital libraries. There's tons of digital libraries that give you this access for free most of them are free some of them do charge and you need permission but that is the beauty of having the technology the age of technology where it reduces that access that problem that accessibility to primary sources and after all that after the research i was able to put together my thesis and at first my thesis was one thing and by the time i finished the research this is what I came up with. 16th century Nahua women monopolized different aspects of their culture in order to establish their leadership and autonomy grounded in the foundational cosmic view that placed female sacred power as a root of political and cultural references. I would never have imagined that I would make that argument. I'm very skeptic about a lot of the findings, a lot of the archive, but the research led me there. The research guided me that and gave me the confidence to be able to say and put together that argument. And that is a short example into the journey of my thesis. And if you have any more, if you want to keep contact with me, if you want me to send you my thesis, I do have social media. I'm very active on there. I go to high schools, universities. I talk about this. I share it with everybody. I have a page on Facebook and YouTube called Digante Like a Woman Warriors. And I have a YouTube channel that is it's a fairly new channel called Decolonizing Academia. And I actually have interviewed Casa de students who are trying their best to decolonize academia, decolonize how we understand indigenous history, how we understand history in general. So with that, thank you for sharing space with me today. Thank you, Dr. Lee, and that's all I got today. Thank you.